Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming to and also being able to be invited to speak about this topic. And the key kind of focus of the respiratory management, or my real passion, is around how do we manage kind of chronic breathlessness and how do we really understand what breathlessness is. Um, so my background is in... Uh, clinically academic, all interested in breathlessness from chronic respiratory. So we have ended up kind of falling into pots due to the way our, our services run at King's, which I'll talk about later, which has led us to try and understand and kind of pilot or try to treat um, breathlessness in this patient group through self-management approach. So consistently within the literature, we know that the symptom burden is highly complex in POTS. And if we look at the data, greater than 65% of patients will report some level of breathlessness, either that being breathlessness at rest or breathlessness on activity or exercise. And it's an important distinction to make is that what these patients are reporting are inappropriate breathlessness at rest. Um, or inappropriate breathlessness on activities of daily living or exercise, because we must always remember that breathlessness is a normal physiological response. However, these patients report an inappropriate or an altered breathlessness response. And breathlessness is a, a complex, um, complex um, symptom, and it can either be acute or it can be prolonged breathlessness. And we we and lots of others have looked at treating the symptom of breath, breathlessness rather than just looking at it in, in terms of compartmentalization of in terms of uh, pathologies or underlying conditions. Um, and it's important to think about what actually breathlessness is. And the American Thoracic Society give us a definition that it is a subjective experience of breathing discomfort and consists of qualitatively distinct sensations that vary in intensity. And essentially that every patient's breathlessness will be different. And I think when we think about breathlessness regarding the underlying conditions, it's also really useful to draw reference or think about the chronic pain literature and also think about the interaction between the neurophysiology but also the psychology of breathlessness. So at King's, uh, we kind of have taken an integrated, kind of pragmatic approach to looking at and trying to understand why our uh, patients with POTS present with breathlessness. And as Nick described earlier, he runs a large uh, cardiology um, <coughs> clinic at King's. And kind of core to understanding or trying to think about breathlessness in this patient group from a diagnostic um, perspective is looking at cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And as Nick alluded to earlier, this is quite a, a complex um, set of data that we get from these cardiopulmonary exercise tests. But the key and recurrent theme that we see with a lot of these patients with inappropriate breathlessness is that they have low levels of uh, tidal carbon dioxide, so low levels of carbon dioxide, your waste gas that you breathe out at rest, um, or during the unloading cycling component of the exercise test right up to the kind of pre-anaerobic threshold level. And how we define that locally with our um, anaesthetist who runs our unexplained breathlessness and cardiopulmonary exercise clinic is that having a lower end tidal less than four kilopascals. And generally what we find is that these patients tend to have normal um, aerobic fitness or kind of slightly deconditioned. Um, and what we find is that it's the breathing pattern that we absorb, uh, see during the exercise test that is more limiting than any other factor or the deconditioning. Um, interesting, what we see is lots of these patients have high res resting respiratory rates and large tidal volumes, which kind of fits with this idea of over-breathing or dysfunctional breathing. To, uh, to eliminate any element of respiratory pathology, our, all our respiratory patients or breathless patients are referred to our respiratory consultants at King's, and they do a plethora of uh, diagnostic tests to uh, rule or exclude any kind of underlying pathology such as asthma, um, COPD, and they're doing through uh, a battery of lung function tests. We also look at capillary blood gases, and we also do a hyperventilation uh, test as well to see their levels of carbon dioxide or can that reproduce their symptoms. And diagnostically, we look at that and we see if they have an end tidal CO2 at rest or after 10 minutes of voluntary hyperventilation of less than 4.3. Um, it's usually indicative of these patients having a, a chronic hyperventilation syndrome or a dysfunctional breathing pattern. And the majority of our patients... Uh, about 95% of patients that we see through this um, have no underlying respiratory or cardiac cause 
to their breathlessness and therefore they're referred on to um, our physiotherapy service at King's. And treatment of dysfunctional breathing patterns in terms of physiotherapy approach is kind of well documented in terms of uh, asthma and brittle asthma and there's been quite a lot of recent uh, literature published around using this as self-management to take, uh, technique in the management of chronic asthma. Um, either delivered face-to-face through therapists or during digital interventions as well. And that's been recently published in the Lancet Respiratory. So there's quite good emerging evidence for this approach for patients with dysfunctional breathing. So when these patients come to the physiotherapy department, we assess their chest wall movements. We look at the respiratory rate. We get them to a breath hold time to look at how well they tolerate increasing levels of carbon dioxide. And also we use the Nijmegen questionnaire, which is kind of the oldest and most validated measure of of how to quantify a dysfunctional breathing pattern, more so the elements of the um, hyperventilation syndrome and associated symptoms. And once we feel that this this is a dysfunctional breathing pattern, then our patients engage in a a personalised treatment approach, which focuses a lot around education and focusing on self management and trying to empower the patients to, uh, to take some control of their breathing pattern. And core to this education is instilling and providing our patients with education around what normal physiology is and kind of trying to bust some of the myths that they may have read on Google about taking big deep breaths and over breathing which is useful and helpful in breathlessness. And and after the education component around the physiology of what normal respiratory is, we also look and and talk to them around the mind-body link and how important it is not only to consider the physiology and the metabolic demands in your body that govern breathlessness, but also look at how anxiety, worry, stress can also increase your your breathing pattern and make these dysfunctional breathing patterns worse as well. Um, And thereafter, we take a kind of breathing retraining (coughs) approach. So we look at trying to get patients to reduce their respiratory rate and try to get them to breathe at a a 10 to 12 breaths per minute. Really encouraging a a nose breathing (coughs) pattern, so breathing in and out through their nose. Often doing these breathing retraining techniques in line because we know from lots of the physiology studies when we go from a a line to an upright posture in parts that they uh, hyperventilate as well and increase the respiratory rate. Um, And we start off with timed controlled breathing of two seconds in, two seconds out and one second um, pause afterwards. So really focusing on getting the patients to have a nice controlled tidal breath in, controlled expiratory phase and then a post-expiratory pause. Because what we find in lots of these patients is they've lost their post-expiratory pause. So they tend to breathe large volumes in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. And that kind of mimics at rest what you would see normally when we exercise. So a normal physiological kind of breathing pattern is a small breath in, out, stop, small breath in, out, stop. And when you exercise or you exert or push your respiratory system, you've got two kind of methods of survival, if you like. We often use the analogy with patients that you, if you're trying to run away from a large animal, one, you can increase your tidal volume, so you can breathe deep in, out, in, out, in, out. Um, Or you can breathe small breath in, out, pause, small breath in, out, pause. And then to get faster, you lose the pause, and you breathe in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. But lots of these patients tend to just breathe in, out, in, out. So when they exercise, they increase their tidal volume and then hit the respiratory limit and become breathless. Breathless. And if we kind of draw an analogy from our chronic respiratory patients, what we know is that these patients that are limited in terms of exercise from their breathlessness, they get lower limb weakness, which we know is a problem because then they get disuse atrophy, which then makes their muscles less efficient, they produce more carbon dioxide, and therefore get this spiral of um, inactivity as well. And what we really, really focus on is, one, trying to get the breathing under control to then try and re-engage them with other therapies and exercise. And when we talk about dysfunctional breathing, I think most people may have heard or most common kind of studied um, syndrome within this kind of umbrella term is this idea of a a hyperventilation syndrome. But often we also see these other kind of subcategories or other um, entities in their own right, so periodic periodic deep breaths, um, (coughs) dominance of uh, thoracic movements or overbreathing using the upper chest, forced expiration at rest, Um, or asynchrony in the way that the the breathing muscles work. 
And, and it's kind of important to kind of note that this is not kind of a continuous um, symptomatic state. It can just be episodic. It kind of triggers that patients can identify. And sometimes it can just kind of come, out, um, come on without any provocation. So that's kind of the idea of what this dysfunctional breathing patterns are about. So who have we seen? So we kind of had a retrospective audit and had a review of our patients that were referred into the physiotherapy over an 18-month period. And consistent with the literature, it's generally a, a predominantly female, young female population. Um, normal spirometry, so normal lung function parameters. A um, couple of smokers, but nothing. Um, uh, and no, none of these patients had any underlying cardiorespiratory disease that would explain their breathlessness. Um, and what we looked at, we did review these patients, and we had full set data on 66 uh, patients. We had a majority of patients that dropped out of the treatment, and some were still undergoing treatment at the time of analysis. Um, so we had quite good engagement with our patients. And what we found was if we look at these graphs on an individual basis in terms of these lines, if we look at the Nymegan, which is a global in index of symptom score, um, we found that the overall, with the treatment at the end, when we discharged patients, that their symptom burden improved. Um, and interestingly enough, when we looked at that and broke it down onto an individual level, 97% of patients reported an improvement in their symptom scores. Um, and the score ranges from 0 to 64, and the diagnostic threshold of having a dysfunctional breathing pattern with more of a hyper hyper. Um, ventilation dominance pattern um, is a score over 24. And when we looked at the data on the individual level, 23% uh, of patients had a, a score at the end of treatment less than 22. So they had no evidence in terms of the symptom score of a dysfunctional breathing pattern. Uh, we also looked at the respiratory rate and we saw that there was a fall in respiratory rate and an improvement in their breath all time. Um, and we can see that their baseline respiratory rates were quite high. Um, but as we improve the respiratory rate, try to normalize it, empower them, give them some more control over their breathing pattern, both at rest and during activity, it led to improvements in their, their symptom burden and symptom <coughs> control. So this is kind of very much a kind of snapshot of what we've done at King's, and it's been very much a pragmatic approach. And I think from today, what would be useful for people to think about is consider what, whether your patients present with a dysfunctional breathing pattern. Um, what we really need to understand is the prevalence, so how common it is in, in the UK, this dysfunctional breathing within POTS. And I think this provides a testable hypothesis that actually maybe if we use a physiotherapy-based patient self-empowered uh, breathing control may help improve some of the symptoms in our POTS patients, or whether this could be combined with more of a holistic approach incorporating some psychology uh, and some more exercise, physical exercise rehab as well, may lead to greater improvements from a non-pharmacological approach for our patients. Uh, we've recently just published um, this paper, so if anyone's interested in kind of the core details and the therapeutic interventions and how we actually ran the clinical service that gave us these outcomes, um, you can access it here. A very uh, appreciate very much a whistle stop tour of kind of breathlessness and pots. I'm very happy to take questions and comments and discuss what we've learned so far.